And now for the moment, I don't know if you all have been waiting for it, but I'm sure you've been expecting it. And then Mood Reader Me was like, poo, and I have not yet gotten back to it, but it is officially Riley Sager season. Nothing like the phrase special edition to get Audrey to buy a book. And dark, deliciously dark. I'm just, I'm already in, I'm already in. It's my time of year, it's my time of year. Hi everybody, it's Audrey and welcome back to Chapter and Converse and welcome to another round of new releases, this time for the month of June. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that song, June is busting out all over, but you guys, June is busting out with so many fantastic new releases, including some of my most anticipated books of the year. So I am so excited for the month of June and I am also so excited, wait for it, to once again be partnering with Book of the Month on today's video. I love me some Book of the Month, you guys, and you know that. You can now get your first book for only $9.99 using the code BREEZE, and you can take advantage of everything the Book of the Month has to offer. They have a curated selection of brand new hardcover new releases and early releases, and they now offer audiobooks. So you can pick your first book for only $9.99 using the code BREEZE. They curate the collection, they do the work for you, a mix of all genres, everything from mysteries and thrillers to rom-coms, historical fiction, narrative nonfiction, memoirs, contemporary, like you name it, they've got it, sci-fi, fantasy. They will do all the work for you and you just get to choose which book you want to bring into your world. You can pick a physical hardcover book. They now have audiobooks, so you can pick an audiobook if that is what you love to do. You guys know I love to listen to my books. And there are so many books to choose from this month, you guys. I about lost my mind when I saw the selection for this month and I had a really hard time deciding what I was gonna go with, but book number one, if you guys have been on my journey, A Talent for Murder by Peter Swanson, it is not an exaggeration to tell you guys, I screamed when I opened up the email. My desire for this book, one of my most anticipated books of the year, I freaked out, automatically got it. I'm going to start reading it today. I cannot wait to dive into this book. He is one of my all-time favorite authors and I just can't wait to find out what's gonna happen in this deliciously dark and messed up thriller, I have no doubt. And then because I am a Libra and I love me some balance, I picked up One Star Romance by Laura Hankin. This is a contemporary rom-com. This is actually gonna be the third of her books that I have read. Love her. Love seeing familiar names and faces when I come into Book of the Month. As much as I love finding somebody new, but this was a month where I definitely treated myself to two of my favorite authors, and I'm excited to dive into their books. And again, you can dive into your book for only $9.99 using the code BREEZE. The link is going to be down below. The code is going to be down below. Again, a reminder, you can get a physical hardcover book or you can get an audiobook. The team at Book of the Month does such a fantastic job curating their collection each month. They choose from thousands of books. They do all of the work and introduce all of us, like I said, to some authors that you know and love, to some new authors. And I just love how easy they are to work with, how easy they are to shop from. Their website is fantastic. Shipping is always free. There's reviews on the site. They give you all of the details you need to know about a book to figure out which is the right one for you. And then it's like magic. The blue box shows up at your doorstep and off and running you go and you get to dive right into your favorite book. So I'm gonna be diving into this one again, only $9.99. You can get your first book using the code BREEZE and you can decide which book you are going to dive into. And while you wait the few days for your package to arrive, you can also dive into their podcast virtual book tour. It's one of my favorites. You guys know how I love listening to authors talk about the story behind the story. I am so hungry for information about authors. I love hearing about their inspiration. I love seeing a bit of insight. I love just hearing them talk, the passion that they have for their books, the passion that Book of the Month has for their authors and for their community is just like none other. So one more time <laughs> for the people in the back. I feel like I always say that. But again, you can get your first book for only $9.99 using the code BREEZE. You can pick one of these books. You can pick another. I'm going to get into some more detail about some dark and messed up murder, some rom-com. You guys, we have a slew of books to talk about this month. So get comfortable. We're going to dive into these. Thank you again so much to Book of the Month for sponsoring today's video. Check out the description box. Check out the code and let's get into everything else coming out in June. 
I have about 20 books to talk about today, so I'm gonna try to keep the descriptions brief. Everything is gonna be listed down below with their pub days, and we're diving right in. So first book up is Such a Bad Influence by Olivia Mentor. I have talked about this book previously on here. I had an e-arc of it and I read it and I really enjoyed it. If you guys have followed me, you know I have followed Olivia through her podcast, Bad on Paper, and her Substack. This is her debut novel. I would say this is more of a slow burn mystery and this follows influencer culture, so a lot of inside baseball from Olivia as an influencer herself. In this book, we are following Hazel, and her younger sister Evelyn is a social media star. She started out as sort of an accidental child star. Her parents had a YouTube channel, and a video went viral when Evelyn was five years old and sort of exploded the family's popularity. At the time, Hazel was 15 years old. She had zero interest in being a part of that culture. So she sort of stepped out of the spotlight and Evelyn was front and center. And when the book opens, Evelyn is doing an Instagram live. She's in a parking lot and you kind of see a hint of a man in the background and then the screen goes black and then nobody hears from Evelyn again. So this is the search for what happened to Evelyn and it is interspersed with Reddit threads, which I absolutely loved totally an inside look at influencer culture, like I said, but also sort of the family YouTube channel culture. And I would say some commentary on the children and people being exposed, maybe not by choice, how families have leveraged those YouTube channels. There's been a lot of chatter about a lot of those YouTube family channels as of late. And we are getting Hazel grappling with what happened to her sister, obviously the search for Evelyn, and then also the background of why Hazel has really removed herself from the family. So we're kind of getting a lot of secrets and things that are going on there. I enjoyed it. It was one of those books, again, where I feel like pace yourself for a slower pace book. A lot of character study in this, and again, a lot of commentary. I was listening to an interview with Olivia Mentor recently where she talked a lot about the parasocial relationship that people have with influencers, thinking that you know them, thinking that even the most authentic of people out there on the internet who are being very transparent, who are being very raw, you never really know anybody, and sort of that complex relationship in this world that we now live in with people being social media stars and just really interesting commentary. So definitely recommend it. Fantastic debut. That's book number one. I will also let you know I have not read like any of these books, so not every, every comment will be that long. The second book I have is Dead Tired by Cat Ailes. This is the second book in the Expectant Detective series, and I read the first one earlier this year. These have come out earlier in the UK than they came out here. So that's why it seems like there's, they're coming out fast and furious here in the US, but I am personally excited about it. In book number one, we met Alice and her husband as they moved from London to the country. She was pregnant, she was going on maternity leave and they wanted to have kind of a new quieter life and raise their child outside the city. There was definitely some friction about the change in lifestyle. And no sooner does she join her first maternity class that somebody gets murdered during the class and it becomes very much a cozy mystery with very great fun witty humor to it and kind of newfound friends trying to figure out what happened in this small town. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I laughed out loud. There is this whole subplot around her dog Helen which is just really funny. Helen is just I'm not even a dog person and I was like all in for the dog of it, but I had a great time with it. So this book picks up one year later and it says being a new mom is murder. Alice didn't think her maternity leave would involve so much, well, murder. But becoming proud new moms, she and her friends bonded more than members of a prenatal group usually would. They became the accidental amateur sleuths in book number one and solved a crime together. Now all of that is behind them. Her son Jack is a year old and Alice is <laughs> taking an opportunity, stay with me, to be part of an eco protest with her friends and they willingly chain themselves to trees and settle in as an excuse to get some overdue rest. So these are all new moms who are not getting any sleep because their kids are so young. So they all leave their kids with their partners, chain themselves to trees, thinking they're just gonna get a good night's sleep out in the wilderness and support this protest in the process. But as you can guess, they wake up the next morning and one of the protesters is found strangled and they are all once again 
pulled into a local mystery. I have very high hopes for this book. Again, I really loved the writing style, the humor of the first book, the friends. It just, it was like witty and snarky and sweet and funny. And I love me some murder, you guys know. I would put it on par with Finley Donovan, kind of that mode of a book. And it just was hilarious. I had a great time with it. I'm very excited for this one. I have a little bit of a true confession about the next book, which is Tell Me Who You Are by Louisa Luna. I don't mean to be dramatic. It's not like a dramatic confession. This book is pitched as The Silent Patient meets Gone Girl. You guys know I am so heavily influenced by book comps of books that I absolutely love. I immediately was like, I'm putting it on the list. Now let me read what it's about. And I was looking at the author's name and I'm like, her name sounds familiar to me. Why does it sound familiar to me? If you guys have been around my channel for a long time, you may remember me on multiple occasions pulling out a book called Two Girls Down by Louisa Luna. It is a thriller that I've had for years that I refuse to unhaul that I swear I'm going to get to. And I feel like the universe has boomeranged. That's not the right word. The universe is throwing me a sign that I need to read Two Girls Down and that I need to read this book. They're not connected in any way, but I, I, I take cues as a mood reader for what to read next. So I'm going to pick up Louise's book, but let me tell you about this one. Okay, this is Brooklyn psychiatrist, Dr. Caroline Strange, is certain she knows what's best for her patients, her family, and pretty much everybody else. But all of that changes when a troubled young man arrives for his appointment and makes a pair of alarming confessions. One, I'm going to kill someone, and two, I know who you really are. I'm just, I'm already in, I'm already in. Now, Dr. Caroline is very used to hearing patients' deepest, darkest secrets. She is used to them saying maybe some outlandish things to her. But in this case, when the police show up the next morning to question her about a missing woman, it appears that her patient has made good on his threats to kill someone. And now she definitely is worried about what he knows about her and she takes things into her own hands. And we've got some past secrets. She's trying to stop whatever's gonna come out. I don't wanna read anything else, but she's got a perfect life that this patient is obviously threatening to blow on up and she's here to stop it. I'm excited, I'm excited. Gone Girl and Silent Patient had a baby and it's this book, I'm all in. Stay tuned for this. Stay tuned for me talking about Two Girls Down because I will. It is, it is a month of amazing thrillers, you guys. It really is. I mean, it always is, but like, I'm gonna keep saying it because there's some real doozies coming up. Okay, next up is The Queen of Poisons by Robert Thorogood. This is number three in the Marlowe Murder series. This is, veers a little bit more on the cozy side. I have talked about the Marlowe Murder Club, which is book number one. I still need to read book number two, but for anyone who is already in the series and is looking to maybe pick up a series, I highly recommend this one. I also talked about Marlowe Murder in my light thriller recommendations video that I did. So if you guys haven't checked that out, that might be a fun one to check out if you're looking for something on the lighter side. But this follows a group of women who banded together in book number one, also an amateur sleuth vibe, similar but different to Dead Tired and The Expectant Detectives. In the first book of the series, we're introduced to Judith Potts. She is 77 and while she is out for a swim one night, she believes she has witnessed a brutal murder of her neighbor. She is quickly disregarded by the police and she winds up again, kind of banding together with a group of women in her community to look into what really happened that night. So a lot of very interesting storyline about becoming older as a woman, being dismissed, being disregarded, how people look at you when you are older and also just great wit and humor that surround this. I, of course, love me some Murder, She Wrote vibes, which it gives me a bit of, I love the series. I definitely need to catch up on it so that I will be ready to read The Queen of Poisons. I don't wanna read what it's about. I don't know that it's gonna give anything away from the earlier books, but just the same. Third book in a series. I do feel like these books are designed so that you can join at any point, but there you go. Third in a series. Check it out, check it out, check it out. So speaking of third in the series, The Housemaid is Watching is also coming out. And I am also <laughs> delinquent on this series. So I read The Housemaid. I still need to read book number two. I for sure don't want to read anything about this because I feel like with a Frieda McFadden book, it's going to tell you some stuff in the book jacket. And I don't know how book number two ended. So I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen in book number three. But The Housemaid was for sure a sensation when it came out. And I can understand the bingeable quality of it because I a thousand percent 
picked it up, read it, binged it, totally enjoyed it. And I I was here for the darkness of it. I was here for the page turningness of it. I do think Frieda McFadden is a great author if you are in a slump, if you are looking to tear through something, if you are just looking to get lost in a book, maybe you've got a day or a weekend to just spend reading. Like her books would definitely be prime for that. So on the off chance you don't know anything about The Housemaid, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about that book to begin with. In that book, we meet Millie. She has come to the Winchester's house to be their nanny, to take care of their younger daughter. And it is like this beautiful, perfect house out on Long Island, rich family, gorgeous husband, all the things. But the wife is not always so nice. The kid is kind of a challenge and the husband is a little bit tempting. But when the book opens, the police are there, we know something has gone horribly wrong, and then we go back in time and build up to it. I definitely didn't see what was coming until it started to unfold. I enjoyed the twists and turns of this. I reviewed this book a while back. There were hearkenings to another book that I read and enjoyed, but I also very much enjoyed, like totally different ending, so much that was different about it, but there was sort of an element of it that reminded me of a different book that I don't want to tell you what the book is, which I know is super annoying, but I feel like it gives stuff away. But I really enjoyed the turn that she took with The Housemaid. I have high expectations for book number two and book number three. I will definitely be checking them out when the time comes and I'll let you guys know what I think of it. But I had fun with it. Again, bingeable, compulsively easy to read and just a really good time and dark, deliciously dark. Okay, it's time. It's the moment I've been waiting for. A Talent for Murder by Peter Swanson. I, I know I already said this, I freaked out when I saw this on the list for Book of the Month this month because you guys know I have been so desperate to get my hands on this book. And am I starting to read it today? Yes, I am. Am I going to tell you what I think of it after I'm done? Of course I am. This is another case of good things are happening in threes. This has characters from The Kind Worth Killing and the kind worth saving. So also kind of a third, maybe like more of a companion novel. I haven't started it yet, so I don't know how much we're gonna find out about the previous books. I do think he makes it so that you can walk right into this book and gobble it up, and I for one am happy about it. So I'm not gonna tell you anything about what happens in the previous books. The short blurb on this is we have a newlywed librarian begins to suspect the man she married is a murderer. I'm in. I'm totally in. So our main character is Martha Ratcliffe. She is a librarian in Maine. She had been very content with how her life was. She never believed she was going to get married. She was never going to meet anyone who really made her want to get married. And then she met Alan, who was charming and sweet natured, a salesman whose job took him on the road for half the year. And they got married, even though he still felt like a little bit of a stranger, she just couldn't say no. The first year of their marriage is fantastic. And this is all I'm going to tell you. It says, a year in, the marriage was good, except for that strange blood streak on the back of one of his shirts he'd worn to that conference in Denver. Curiosity turns to suspicion and things are going to continue to happen from there. I love the cover of this book. It says, no murder is by the book. I love how Peter Swanson plays with well-known tropes with, I mean, the Kymerth killing is strangers on a plane. I am such a massive fan of his. I know I don't stop talking about him, but there's good reason for it. I love how dark and messed up he is. I love the, the places his books go to. He is often in and around Boston, in and around New England. I love the settings. I love his characters. He goes all in. He doesn't hold back. He is one of my all-time favorite authors. And I can't wait to read this book. And I'm so excited it was a book of the month book this month. So there you go, A Talent for Murder. If you guys are not already on the Peter Swanson train, there is no better time to climb aboard. <laughs> like strangers on a train, right? You knew I had to do it. You knew I had to do it. Okay, next up, next up. The next book I have is The Final Act of Juliet Willoughby. And this is by Ellery Lloyd. I loved The Club, which was their thriller that came out a couple of years ago. This is a husband and wife writing team. And this book says, some women can't be painted out of history. It's a story of love and madness, of obsession and revenge. This book veers slightly out of my comfort zone in that we start in Paris in 1938. Runaway heiress Juliet Willoughby perishes with her married lover in an accidental studio fire alongside her surrealist masterpiece, Self-Portrait as Sphinx. 
Then we have Cambridge in 1991. Two art history students stumble across proof something sinister was at play in Juliet's death threatening to expose the long buried secrets of the artist's aristocratic family. And then we have present day in Dubai. An art dealer is accused of the brutal murder of his oldest friend, the last surviving member of the Willoughby dynasty. Three suspicious deaths over the course of a century is the key to unlocking them all hidden in Juliet Willoughby's lost painting. So I say outside my zone because we have a 1938 timeline. I don't know how long we're going to stay there, but you guys also know I do very well with historical timelines as long as it's grounded in present day and it's grounded in a fantastic story that I love. Very high expectations for this. Like I said, I loved the club. It was dark and messed up. It just, ooh, it scratched so many itch itches, itches, itches. <laughs> so stay tuned for more on this one. And I'm just excited. I'm very excited. I do love Paris. Who doesn't love Paris? Give me some art stuff. Give me some mysteries. Give me some mysterious deaths. I'm in. The next book I believe is going to be a little bit lighter. This is called Jackpot Summer by Alyssa Friedland. This is about the Jacobson siblings who win a life-changing fortune in the lottery. They assume their messy lives will transform into sleek storybook perfection, but they couldn't be more wrong. So it is pitched as a laugh out loud book which is why I think it's gonna be lighter than the other ones. I'm just going off what they're telling me here. The four siblings in the Jacobson family are reuniting when their newly widowed father puts their Jersey Shore home on the market. They are packing up all of their childhood memories. Everybody's got stuff going on in the present day. And then one of the siblings, Noah, sees an ad for a Powerball drawing and they go to get a ticket. One of the siblings passes, but the ticket is a winner and all hell breaks loose as the infusion of cash causes sibling rivalries and family secrets to resurface. Without their mother and with their father busy playing pickleball in a Florida retirement village, the once close siblings search for comfort in shiny new toys instead of in each other. It's not long before the Jacobsons start to realize that they'll never feel rich unless they can pull their family back together. So I am speculating that there is going to be some weightiness to this. There's going to be some warmth to this. There's like it says, there's going to be some laugh out loud humor to this. I can only imagine being a family of four and being the person who doesn't go in on the Powerball ticket. That is like a kajillion dollars. So we will see. But this one sounds fun. Jersey Shore, summertime, good time, like a perfect summer read. I'm in, I'm in. Next up is another one of my most favorite authors. This is The Midnight Feast by Lucy Foley. I did pre-order this from the UK. There was a special edition pre-order. Of course, I had to jump on that boat because there's nothing, <laughs> nothing like the very special edition to get Audrey to buy a book. I love Lucy Foley. I really, really do. This is Secrets, Lies, Murder. Let the festivities begin. In, I would say, typical Lucy Foley fashion, it looks like we get multiple POVs. We are described as the founder, the husband, the mystery guest, the kitchen help. Everyone has an agenda, everyone has a past, but not everyone will survive the midnight feast. So we get opening night of the manor, no expenses have been spared. And it says, yet just outside the manor's immaculately kept grounds, an ancient forest bristles with secrets. The local community resents what they see as the manor's intrusion into the local woods and attempts to privatize the beach and small skirmishes have erupted on the edges of property between the locals and the staff. And the whispers keep coming about an old piece of pagan folklore. It must be folklore. The Nightbirds, an avenging force that can be called upon to, to right wrongs that elude the law. Though surely everything at the manor has been done above board. But on the Sunday morning of opening weekend, the local police are called. There's been a fire. A body's been discovered. Something's not right with the guests. What happened on the grounds of the manor in the past 36 hours and who or what is the cause? Again, speculation. <laughs> Based on the hunting party and the guest list, I suspect we are going to start with the police showing up and then go backwards in time and piece together what's happened at the Midnight Feast. I've heard some great pre-buzz about this book. Again, you guys know The Hunting Party is one of my favorite books of all time. I love the setup in a book where you know somebody's dead and then you go back and try and figure out what happened. I'm all in. I'm all in. I don't know what is up with the manor. I don't know what shenanigans this place is doing. This reminds me very little of 
The Last Party by Claire McIntosh, where we had the community of rich people who built these vacation homes sort of on the border of Wales. And it was this rub between the locals who were really angry that the rich people came. And in the opening pages of that book, one of the rich ringleaders is found dead. And it creates that rub again between the community and the guests. So I don't know, maybe a similar vibe to that, but I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. And now for the moment, I don't know if you all have been waiting for it, but I'm sure you've been expecting it. Middle of the Night by Riley Sager, one of my most anticipated books of the year. I did not get my hands on this one ahead of time either, but I'm okay because it's almost here. It's almost here. It's almost here. I can wait at this stage of the game. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I, I will read anything he writes. No questions asked. He is like a Peter Swanson to me. I don't need to know what the book is. I'm just buying it. So here we go. New Riley Sager. And I, of course, also want to read a, uh, not too much about it. When I was listening to him promote The Only One Left last year, he was talking about this book because he had finished it. And this is his first book where he has a male POV as one of the POVs in the book. So I'm particularly interested in that. He did the book within the book for Home Before Dark, but this is a little bit of a change. He usually has a female protagonist. So I'm very intrigued by that one. And this is a man must contend with the long ago disappearance of his childhood best friend and the dark secrets lurking just beyond the safe confines of his picture perfect neighborhood. We are following Ethan Marsh and it says the worst thing to ever happen on Hemlock Circle occurred in his backyard. One July night, 10 year old Ethan and his best friend and neighbor Billy fell asleep in a tent set up on the manicured lawn in a quiet, quaint New Jersey cul-de-sac. In the morning, Ethan woke up alone. During the night, someone had sliced the tent open with a knife and taken Billy, and he was never seen again. So all I know after that, because I am again like half looking at this review, or blurb, 30 years later, Ethan is making a reluctant return home, and I think he is haunted by what happened in the past, and he's trying to look into it. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. I already saw somebody post a review online that I feel like said just one thing I didn't need to know. So I don't want to know anything else. And I'm not going to tell you guys anything else. But as soon as I read it, I will tell you guys, spoiler free, everything I think about it. But it is officially Riley Sager season. And here we go. Here we go. <laughs> it's my time of year. It's my time of year. Okay. Next up, another sequel. This is The Next Mrs. Parrish by Liv Constantine. Talk about a book that was a sensation. I loved The Last Mrs. Parrish. I, I just, I feel like I like bought it when it came out and binged it. And it was another one of those books that really just got me in so many ways. And I'm very interested in rereading that. I feel like before I read this, even though I remember what it's all about, I kind of want to get back into that world for half a minute and then get back and then like get into, into this world. I don't want to talk too much about it because on the chance you haven't read The Last Mrs. Parrish, I don't want to give you too much, but we are reuniting with some of our characters from book number one. And I'm just trying to see how far into the future this is. I'm not worried about what it says, but I don't want to ruin it for anybody here if you haven't read the first book. Okay, found it. It says less than a year since dot dot dot, because it kind of tells you what happened in book number one. And we have people reuniting. We have a ghost from the past. We've got some revenge angle, it appears. It basically just says with shocking turns and entertaining characters, the next Mrs. Parrish will make you rethink everything you thought you knew about duplicity and betrayal. If you have not already read book number one, that's all you need to know. But I highly recommend Last Mrs. Parrish. It's still my favorite Liv Constantine book. And I'm excited to be back into this world. I'm, I'm just really intrigued by what they're going to do with this. And characters were in a certain place, literally and figuratively, at the end of book number one. And I'm very curious what, what we're going to see happen with these, these people in book number two. There you go. Okay. Brief and cryptic and... There you go. It's a thriller. It's a, it's a second in a series. It's so hard to talk about. Okay, let's get you one. Oh, this is this is even worse. This is book number four. <laughs> the book itself is not worse. Talking about it is even worse. Okay, Shadow Heart by Meg Gardner. This is book number four in the Unsub series. So I am also going to hesitate to read anything about this because I am only on book number two of this series, which 
shame on me. This book was supposed to come out last year and it got pushed. And I don't know if it's because another one of Meg Gardner's books came out last year and they were trying not to have them all stack on top of each other. But book number one in the Unsub series follows our detective Caitlin Hendricks and her father had been a cop in San Francisco. It is kind of based on the Zodiac Killer is the inspiration for that. Each of Meg Gardner's books in this Unsub series are kind of based on a famous serial killer. And Caitlin winds up sort of getting pulled into sort of a copycat of the case her father spent his life investigating and never solved. And she gets pulled into it. It's such a well-written book. Meg Gardner is flipping fantastic. If you guys are not reading her, she's such an amazing author. And I loved that book. And I fell into my own self-imposed trap where I was like, this is so good. I kind of want to read the next one immediately, but I also want to space it out because I don't want to run out of things to read. And then Mood Reader Me was like, poo, and I have not yet gotten back to it. So in this book, we've got more serial killers. I, I again, don't want to read too much about it because selfishly, <laughs> I don't want to know. But Into the Black Nowhere is book number two, which is where I am. That has some Ted Bundy hearkenings to it is my understanding. And after having read Bright Young Woman last year, I definitely was on a bit of a kick. I'm going to stick with the series. I will let you guys know what I think when I get to this one. And I'm just really, really excited about it. So I would say if you like serial killer thrillers, FBI investigation, police investigation, it was fast paced. It was definitely on the darker side of things, well plotted, like great mystery. You're kind of puzzling things out with her. No way did I come close to figuring anything out, but it's action packed. It's definitely edge of seat kind of vibes to it and i'm not usually like a like a full throttle action person but it was like that perfect blend of action and again i do love the investigation fbi police stuff happening and take it with a grain of salt but i also love a serial killer book so shadow heart coming out finally check it out but if you are not here for the murder of it all i still have you covered we have one star romance by laura hankin this is my second book of the month pick also let out a bit of a scream when I saw this one because I am so excited for this. I read The Daydreams last year when that came out and then recently I read A Special Place for Women which was her second book. So yes, I am kind of working my way backwards through her list. But when she was doing promotion for The Daydreams, she was talking about this book. It's like a deja vu to me telling you the Riley Sager story. But she talked about how she was writing a rom-com about a woman who was in her friend's wedding and has to walk down the aisle with a man who gave her book a one-star review. And that actually happened to Laura Hankin in real life, which <laughs> I just love that story. So who's more uncomfortable? You being like, dude, you gave me a one-star review or the guy being like, I have to walk down the aisle with the woman whose book I gave a one-star review and she knows it. I love her humor. I think Laura Hankin is fantastic. So we've got we've get, those aren't words. We have Natalie and Rob. They couldn't have less in common. Natalie's a messy artist and Rob's a rigid academic. The only thing they share is their devotion to their respective best friends who just got engaged. Still unexpected chemistry has Natalie cautiously optimistic about being the maid of honor to Rob's best man. But shortly before the ceremony, Rob writes that one star review of her new book. And this has them both reeling, Natalie from imposter syndrome and Rob over the reason he needed to write it. Dun, dun, dun. Why would he need to write a one-star review? When the reception ends, these two opposites hope they'll never meet again. But as they slip from their 20s into their 30s, they're forced together whenever their fast-track best friends celebrate another milestone. Through housewarmings and christenings, life-changing triumphs and failures, Natalie and Rob grapple with their own choices and with how your hard and with how your harshest critic can become your perfectly imperfect match. After all, sometimes even the truest love stories need a bit of rewriting. So I'm going to guess this is a happily ever after book. We will see. But I'm very much looking forward to more of her good humor and just strong writing. She definitely takes some strong viewpoints on things. She has fun with it. I loved the Daydreams had that Mickey Mouse Club vibe TV show and the 
group reunited for a reunion and all these past secrets and dramas came out. A Special Place for Women definitely has some overarching stuff. Stay tuned for my full review on that, which will come out after this video. And again, I really just enjoy her writing. She makes a lot of pop culture references. She just has a real great way of weaving together what I love in any kind of rom-com, which is some weightiness to a storyline, just very human characters that you can relate to, breaks it up with those levity moments, but still has some overarching heaviness because life is heavy and nothing is always levity. And I really appreciate how real her books feel. A Special Place for Women was set in New York City, which I loved, things that were familiar to me, locations that were familiar. This book, I'm not sure where it's set, but it's not gonna make or break my decision to read it, obviously, because I'm a huge fan of hers. And I just think she's a great talent. So I'm very happy I discovered her through the daydreams last year. All of her books are standalones. And why not start with this one this month from Book of the Month. So stay tuned, full review coming after I read it. But you know, I'm, I'm gonna go dark and messed up first. Okay, but levity, levity, if you guys need levity with weightiness, just pop that over here for now. That's your book, that's your book. Next up is Lula Dean's Little Library of Banned Books by Kristen Miller. Kristen Miller wrote The Change, which I am embarrassed to admit I haven't read yet. And then I saw she had a new book out. This is kind of similar to the Louisa Luna book where I was like, I, I, am, I am so delinquent on these authors. So this one definitely caught my attention. This book is described as a provocative and hilarious summer read that will have book lovers cheering and everyone talking. A bracing, wildly entertaining satire about a small southern town, a pitched battle over banned books, and a little lending library that changes everything. In this book, we have two arch enemies, Beverly and Lula, who are born and raised in the small town of Troy, Georgia. Beverly is on the school board, and Lula has become a local celebrity by embarking on a mission to rid the public library of all the inappropriate books, which she has never actually read. And Lula has created a free little library in front of her house, which is now filled with neat rows of the worthy literature that she's sure that the readers of the town need. But Beverly's daughter Lindsay sneaks in by night and secretly fills Lula Dean's little free library with a banned book wrapped in a wholesome dust jacket. The Girl's Guide to the Revolution is wrapped in the cover of the Southern Belle's Guide to Etiquette. A jacket that belongs to our Confederate heroes ends up on Beloved. One by one, neighbors who borrow books from Lula Dean's library find their lives changed in unexpected ways. Finally, one of Lula Dean's enemies discovers the library and decides to turn the tables on her, just as Lula and Beverly are running against each other to replace the town's disgraced mayor. That's when the townspeople who've been borrowing from Lula's library begin to reveal themselves. It says it's a diverse and surprising bunch, including the local postman, the prom queen, housewives, a farmer, and the former DA all of whom have been changed by what they've read. When Lindsay is forced to own up to what she's done, the showdown, the showdown that's been brewing between Beverly and Lula will royal the whole town and change it forever. <laughs> I love the idea <laughs> that she is wrapping the books in different covers. I feel like there was a time where people talked about this when you were on this, like if you were commuting and reading a book that you didn't want people to know you were reading, whether it felt smutty or you thought people were going to judge you or whatever it was that people would change the book covers or I don't know if you guys remember I remember having this like years ago you could buy a book cover for it I remember bookstores used to sell this where you could like slip it over your paperback whether it was like to protect the cover but you could hide what you were reading in case you were reading something I distinctly remember reading the beauty series by Anne Rice when I was commuting in Boston and being like <laughs> Nobody knows what I'm reading. It was just a little bit, it was a little bit steamy for, uh, for, for, you know, 7 a.m. on your way to work. But anyway, this one sounds really fun. Who doesn't love a free little library? I love that she's messing with it. And I'm just very intrigued. I've heard great things about Kristen Miller. Like I said, I am delinquent on reading her. Time's, time to fix it. Time to fix it. Okay, next up, this is a book that I absolutely stumbled upon kind of by mistake, which is sometimes the best way to find a book. And this is called The Memo. This is by Rachel Dodes and Lauren Meschling. It says, if you could rewrite your life story, would you dare? 
that's the question at the heart of this charming and propulsive debut about love, life, and a woman finding herself and what it means to be happy and successful. I have talked many times how I love a book that gives you that second chance vibe, particularly if there's like an element of magical realism that lets you go back in time and maybe make changes or revisit things. This is definitely like a sweet spot of mine that I don't see a ton and I feel like I don't talk about a ton, but I absolutely love. In this one, we have Jenny Green dreads her upcoming college reunion. Once top of her class, the 35-year-old finds herself stuck in a life that isn't the one she expected. Her promising career has flamed out, literally, and her deadbeat boyfriend is cheating on her, again. All of her friends seem to have it all figured out, enjoying glittering lives and careers that she can only envy from the sidelines. Did she just not get the memo? They all did? Well, as it turns out, she literally didn't get the memo. When she arrives at her alma mater for the festivities, she receives a text from an unlisted number that says, quote, Jenny, please come collect your memo. Somewhere on campus, a discreet female-led organization provides comprehensive memos to select students, a set of instructions that are a blueprint for success. The first time around, Jenny didn't receive hers. Now she's being given the second chance she wants, an opportunity to relive her life and make all the right decisions this time around. But what's the price? I'm so intrigued. This one sounds so fun. And I'm not gonna lie. I, I mean, I get it, like no regrets. And I know you literally can't go back and change things, but I, not gonna lie. There's definitely moments I think back on and if I had gone left instead of right, if I had taken that job instead of this one, if I had ended this relationship or started this one or just made different choices along the way, I know every choice you made is what led you here. And we can all think there's a reason why we are where we are, but I don't, I don't know if anybody else plays that the what if game, the what if game and just wonders what could have been. So I'm very excited to see what could have been for Jenny. And I don't know. I don't know. We'll find out when we read it. Okay. Next. Next is two sides to every murder by Danielle Valentine. I don't know why I was singing. This is a YA thriller. I loved How to Survive Your Murder, which I read two years ago, I wanna say, which kind of had a very scream heavy inspiration to it. It was so much bloodier than I expected it to be and I loved it. And this is about two teens who return to the site of the famous murder case that sealed their fates. I'm excited. Most people's births aren't immortalized in a police report, but Olivia was born during the infamous Camp Lost Lake murders. 17 years later, Olivia's life looks pretty perfect until she discovers the man she calls dad is not her biological father. That's gotta not be great. Now she wants answers about her bloodline and the only place she knows to look is Camp Lost Lake. <sighs> it's probably not gonna go well, Olivia. Most people don't spend their formative years on the run with an alleged murderer, but Reagan did. In the court of public opinion, her mom was found guilty of the deaths at Camp Lost Lake and both of them have been hiding ever since. But Reagan believes in her mother's innocence and is determined to clear her name. Luckily for Olivia and Reagan, Camp Lost Lake is finally reopening, providing the perfect opportunity to find answers. But someone else is dead set on keeping the past hidden, even if it means committing murder. I almost a thousand percent said, but someone else is dead, period. <laughs> someone else is dead set. A little bit of last time I lied vibes. I love that Danielle Valentine is dark and messed up. I very much enjoy her as a writer. I have invested in some of her writing courses, which I think are fantastic. And I just, I'm, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. So love me a murdery YA book. And I particularly like when they go exceptionally dark and I'm expecting Danielle Valentine to not hold back. And I will let you guys know what I think about it because I did pre-order it. The next book I have is a novel love story by Ashley Poston. I feel like there's a lot of really good books for writers, about writers, writer vibes to it this month, which love, love, love. This is a professor of literature finds herself caught up in a work of fiction, literally. In this book, we are following Eileen Merriweather and she loves to get lost in a good happily ever after, the fictional kind at least, because at least imaginary men don't leave you at the altar. She feels safe in a book. She's at home in a book. And that's why she's so set on going to her annual book club retreat this year in need of good friends, cheap wine, and grand romantic, grand romantic gestures. I almost got it right. Grand romantic gestures, no matter what. 
But when her car unexpectedly breaks down on the way, she finds herself stranded in a quaint town that feels like it's right out of a novel, because it is. Dun, dun, dun. The place can't be real, and yet here she is in Ellerton. Eller, Ellerton? Ellerton? E-L-O-R-A-T-O-N. Ellerton? The town of her favorite romantic series, where the candy store's honey taffy is always sweet, the local bar's burgers are always a little burnt, and rain always comes in the afternoon. And it feels like home. It's perfect and perfectly frozen, trapped in the late author's last unfinished story. So she is in a story she can't quite place or escape. And she is convinced that she is here to help bring the town to its storybook ending. I feel like this is going to be very meta and fun. I'm very intrigued. I, again, I love a little bit of magical realism. I love having a good time. I love dark and messed up, but I also like to, to balance it out. And that's what I'm going to do. So there you have it. Okay. Dark and messed up. Although I have heard this is more character study than like hardcore thriller. This is Love Letters to a Serial Killer by Tasha Corell. Coriel? Coriel. Love the cover. Love the title. Totally in for this book. When handsome lawyer Wesley is arrested for a series of murders, recently ghosted 30-something Hannah begins writing him letters as an outlet for both her frustration at her failure to launch and her feminist rage. The exercise empowers her and even feels healthy at first until Wesley writes back. The correspondence tips Hannah's interest in the case from curiosity to obsession, leaving space for nothing else as her life implodes around her. Hannah is the first person Wesley calls upon his release, and they quickly fall into a routine of domestic bliss. Well, as blissful as one can feel while secretly investigating their partner for serial murder. Now, I have heard a lot of mixed reviews on this book, and this seems to be a book that either strikes your fancy or maybe isn't working for you. But one of the best reviews I feel like I have read was go into it with zero expectation. And if it's the book for you, brilliant. And if it's not, so sorry <laughs> that it's not for you. But I don't think it is fast paced thriller vibes. I think it is definitely more character study and that there is more layers to it and i think it's going to be one of these books where people who who rally for this book are going to rally really loud and i've heard it's kind of unhinged and a little bit off the rails and i'm i'm here for all of that kind of stuff and i'm here for some feminist rage so torture poet society right let's do it let's do it i'm in my feminist rage mode <laughs> Next up is Honey by Isabel Banta. This is a coming of age story that follows the meteoric rise of singer Amber Young as she navigates fame in the late 90s and early 2000s era of pop music stardom. I love, I, I'm already, I'm like, Britney? Is this like Britney era? I'm totally here for it. It's 1997 and Amber Young has received a life-changing call. It is a chance thousands of girls would die for, the opportunity to join the girl group Cloud9 in Los Angeles and escape her small town. I definitely need to watch Girls 5 Eva, but it's the first thing I'm thinking of as I'm reading this blurb slash Spice Girls. She quickly finds herself in the orbits of fellow rising stars Gwen Morris, a driven singer-dancer, and Wes Kingston, a member of the biggest boy band in the world, ETA. It's just going to play on all of it, isn't it? If Spice Girls and NSYNC had a baby, is that what's happening here? As Amber embarks on her solo career and her fame intensifies, her rich interior life is frequently reduced. Surrounded by people who claim to love her, but only wish to exploit her, and driven by a desire for recognition and success, for love and sex, for agency and connection, Amber comes of age at a time when the kaleidoscope of public opinion can distort everything, and one mistake can shatter a career. It says, this debut novel redefines the narratives of some of the most famous pop icons of the 90s and 2000s, and reimagines the superstars we idolized and hated, over-sexualized and underestimated, and gives them fresh multifaceted gives them the fresh multifaceted story they deserve. I am expecting some deep commentary, the past few years, a re-examination of that time, people's participation in a lot of it. Just, I, I think it's going to be really interesting. One of these reviews says it's Daisy Jones meets the 90s and aughts. I'm into it. I love a music story. I love a music story. So many, so many true confessions in this. Did I want to be a pop star as a kid? Absolutely. Did I have a voice? No. <laughs> I mean, what I wouldn't give to have a beautiful voice. 
I, I, know, I know it's not good, but it, it won't stop me from singing. Um, anyway, it's fine. It's gonna be fun. It's gonna be a good book. I'm very interested in it. And I'll let you guys know. I'll let you guys know. But I do love a, a musical journey. Okay, last book. You guys are like, oh my gosh, girl, come on. Last book. This is The Bitter Truth by Shonora Williams. We have a little bit of a political spin on this one. We have an upstanding political candidate, a determined stalker, and a shattering lost weekend. When his worst secret comes calling, how far will one man's elegant, all too devoted wife go to uncover the truth or to bury it? Jolene Baker, the least she can do for her adoring husband, Dominic, is to give him unwavering support for his North Carolina gubernatorial race. He's not only the love of her life, he's also helping her prove that she's far more than just a pampered trophy wife. Huge crowds are showing up at Dominic's speeches. The polls are consistently going in his favor. She is so happy and proud to stand by his side. And then they start seeing the same strange, ominous woman turning up at all the events along the campaign trail. And then the tour starts to become a nightmare, a series of botched events, crucial missed information, and increasingly dangerous accidents. Suddenly, Joe can't get any answers from Dominic or understand why he's acting so paranoid and terrified. She starts to dig into his past, never before having questioned his perfect image. And what results is an alarming series of events, leaving good friends turned into enemies, truths revealed to be lies, and all clues lead back to one secret, shattering weekend that changes Joe's entire life. While hiding the bitter truth, by any means necessary, destroy her and her husband. We'll find out, we'll find out. I love, like you think you know, but you have no idea. Definitely has a different, but similar, not at all vibe to The Good Wife. I don't know, stand by your man and then you find out what, you did what, so I don't know what he did, but it doesn't sound good. Sounds like he made one massive mistake and someone's here to have him pay for it. And that's kind of my favorite thing. Revenge, coming back for more. We'll see what happens. So much happening this month in new releases, so much to figure out in all of these books, mainly like where to start. Luckily, I've already decided where I'm gonna start. But thank you again so much to Book of the Month for sponsoring today's video. Again, you guys can get your first book for only $9.99 using the code BREEZE. You can choose from a physical book, you can choose from one of their audio books. Check out everything down below, codes down there, information, link to their website, all that great stuff. Let me know, you guys, where are you starting in the month of June with the new releases? Are you going all nice, dark, messed up thriller like I am? Are you going a little bit rom-com vibe? Let me know. But I am so grateful for everyone being here today, for watching. And let me know, which, which book did I talk about that you were excited about? Which book did I miss that you're excited about? Let me know down below. I will see you guys in the next video. Thank you again so much for being here, and I will talk to you guys soon. Take care, everybody. Bye.